It is one of the few remaining growth industries we have in this country, and it's good to see that it's vibrant and buoyant and will continue to be so. So now let's get into the mind of the RV owner, and it's really solar power has really revolutionized the RV industry, perhaps in the last 10 years. Any camping or caravan site you go to these days, you just see solar panels everywhere. Um, and you've basically got a couple of choices. You can either fill the top of your caravan with solar panels um, as a fixed um, option, or you can use um, portable folding solar panels, and it's largely a preference one or the other, but there are some advantages, I think, more so with going portable, because you can park your RV in the shade and put the solar panel out 10 meters away. As long as you size the cable to minimize the bolt drop, then you can charge your battery uh, with the solar panel 10 meters over there. The problem with putting solar panels on the roof of your RV is that um, if you park in the shade, then the solar panels and the other thing is, if you're using your alternator to charge the battery when you're driving down a highway, what's the point of putting solar panels on the top of the caravan? So people always used to come to me and say, I want to put panels on my roof. I said, if you actually go through the exercise with them and talk to them about what they're actually trying to do, quite often they end up buying a portable solar panel because it, it makes more sense. But solar now is so cheap, really, for a solar panel. The rule of thumb, I think, and Colin would agree, is if you've got space on your caravan roof, just fill it with as much solar panel as you can. Because it's so cheap now to put solar panels on a caravan. So what does what RV owner really want? I mean, he's looking for a battery, but yeah, but what is, what is, what is the benefit of that? And I've always said it's freedom, independence, and peace of mind. Freedom to be able to go wherever you want to go, whenever you want to go. Independence, that you're, you're not constrained by going to powered caravan sites and spending $30 a night just for the privilege of plugging into the wall. So you're independent for those people. And you've got peace of mind. Peace of mind knowing that as long as the sun rises tomorrow, <coughs> it will, um, that you have the ability to generate amps and recharge your battery. So that's, at the end of the day, we're selling batteries, but really what we're selling is, I think, freedom. And that's why our tagline is power and freedom, because that's essentially what we're doing, is we're giving people the ability to go wherever they want, whenever they want. The term free camping now is becoming a very colloquial term. People don't want to be constrained. They want to do what they want, whenever they want to do it. Um, that might be for, for financial reasons, so they don't want to spend $30 a night. I think it's growing more and more so that people actually want to do the right thing by the environment and they want to be self-sufficient with respect to their power needs. So let's start looking at uh, lithium versus lead acid. So solar has provided freedom for RV owners. Um, when it comes to battery storage, <coughs> really now talking about how much freedom do you want? What appliances do you want to run? How many days of autonomy do you want if it rains for three days? You know, you want to have enough battery capacity in your caravan to be self-sustaining for X number of days. And that again is a personal preference. How often does it rain for three days straight in Australia and you don't see any sun? Pretty rarely. Doesn't really happen that often. So if you have typically caravans come with 100 or 120 amp hour deep cycle battery, either an AGM or a gel, that's standard. To be honest, you don't really need much more than that for the average person. Um, people will come to me and say, oh, I want to add another battery. I said, really? Why? If people think that the more batteries they have in a caravan, the better. But it's actually you want more solar because the faster you can charge your battery, the better. When you add another battery, you're adding another 32 kilos of lead that you're towing around that you're never even using that capacity. So it's really about... Um, you know, how much freedom do you want? Um, and more and more so now, what appliances do you want to run? Because with lead acid, we'll see in a moment that you can't run certain appliances just by because of the sheer uh, characteristic of how lead acid batteries work. With lithium, you're deconstrained, uh, so you can run more hungry appliances. Um, this number's a bit old, but I think there's probably more than 300,000 RVs registered now in Australia. I would guess that most of those, 99%, would have a lead acid battery in it. So there's a huge opportunity there, I think, to 
transition over the next 5, 10, 15 years away from lead acid to lithium, and we'll see the benefits in a moment of why that might be the case. But there is a massive opportunity as a, as a business, as a commercial business, to, to, I guess, encourage this transition away from lead acid to lithium. And lithium really is now a commercially viable alternative. There's nothing really else on the market that I guess you could use in an RV other than a lead acid or a lithium battery. Um, and, and that's a good thing. You can either charge a battery with solar, a DC charger, or AC mains. So they've really got three charging options with your caravan or motorhome and how you charge that battery. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Lead acid uh, deep soil, pros and cons, okay, so we pretty much know now we're in day two of this conference, we talked about this a lot. Lead acid batteries are cheap and cost effective, they're readily available, I mean you can pretty much get a battery from anywhere these days. Uh, the technology is well understood and has been around for over 100 years. The disadvantages of course is weight, now one of the biggest um, gripes of any RV owner is weight, because you've only got a certain amount of quota of weight you can add to the caravan before you exceed certain limitations on the axle and, and towing weight as well. So RV owners are very weight conscious. And they're very interested in being able to save weight if they can. So there's a genuine interest there. Even, even if an RV owner can't afford a lithium battery, there's still a lot of interest there as to maybe in a few years time I might be able to afford a lithium battery. So you're essentially carrying around lead and sulfuric acid. Um, of which if you overcharge, you can gas uh, a deep cycle battery, even the modern ones, the well regulated sealed lead acid batteries, if you continuously overcharge them, will vent. And hydrogen is a very explosive light gas, and with a very low emission point. And the irony is, in the older caravans, guess where the battery is stored, usually under the bed. Now, in my parents' caravan, that's certainly the case. I wouldn't want to have a caravan where you were toxic, um, potentially gassing hydrogen battery underneath my bed. So there's certainly been lots of documented cases where batteries have swelled, um, gassed, and even caused explosions. Lead acid batteries have a limited uh, discharge capability um, compared to lithium. You just can't run certain hungry appliances like microwaves off lead acid. Um, generally regarded 50% DOD is an acceptable level of discharge if you want any sort of longevity out of the battery. Obviously, most people that I speak to get it. They understand the shallower the cycle, the longer the battery will last, but people are notoriously bad at looking after lead acid batteries. And the reason is for that, with respect to RVs, is a lot of RVs are just parked on the driveway for six months of the year. And if you forget, to uh, triple charge your lead acid battery. By the time you come to use it, you've got a, a flat battery that's been flat for months, and you just pretty much bug it. Um, sulfation is the, is the end result of that, and you can't really recover from that. So you can damage a lead acid battery very, very quickly, and unless you really understood, understand how to look after a lead acid battery, you might find you're buying lead acid batteries every couple of years, because you don't really understand how to look after them. And you cannot crank with a deep cycle, so I should have put there deep cycle. Again, the internal design of a, a deep cycle battery is different from a cranking battery, so you can't turn over an engine with a deep cycle. You probably could, probably get away with it a few times, but you'd damage the battery pretty quick. But with lithium, you can crank engines off uh, lithium batteries. Lithium ion phosphate is the chemistry we're using, and I think that's been explained why last couple of days, it's generally regarded as the safest. Um, <coughs> pros and cons again, so the advantage is weight. Um, so if weight is the biggest concern for an RV owner, then lithium fits that, or solves that problem very nicely. So you're looking at about 15 kilos for a 100 amp hour lithium battery, it's about half of what a lead acid equivalent is. But what you've got to consider is the, the usable amp hours as well, because the next point there, you can use 80% capacity of that 100 amp hours, uh, whereas in a lead acid, you've only got sort of 
So if you're comparing usable amp hours, then you're actually looking at even more of a weight advantage because you've actually got more energy density for half the weight as well. So you get a double benefit there. Uh, in terms of cycles, 80% uh, DOD, looking at over 2,000 cycles, and really, how often does an RV own a cycle of batteries? I mean, my parents, the caravan sat in the driveway for 12 months and they haven't touched it. So, in terms of cycles, it can be anything from every day. If you're a really serious RV owner and you, you'll make it your lifestyle where you're continually out there on the road, or you might not cycle at all during the year. So, you've got these extremities of use and I guess we have to be able to design a battery that caters for that extremities of use. So there's no reason why you could get 10 years plus out of a um, lithium battery if you're cycling every couple of days on average. Uh, lithium uh, non-toxic I guess, this is all relative, I guess everything's toxic at some point, but non-toxic compared to lead acid, non-gassing more environmentally friendly than that. Um, but this is a big one, higher discharge currents. Um, lithium batteries um, themselves um, can discharge very high currents, but it's the BMS <coughs> that limits or caps um, how many amps you can pull out of a lithium battery. And it's a very important thing to look at when, if you're in the market to buy a lithium battery for your caravan, you've really got to look at what appliances am I running and make sure that the BMS in the battery that you buy allows you to pull enough amps to run that appliance. What a lot of people do is they buy a lithium battery, not realising that it's capped at 100 amps, and they try and run something that needs more than 100 amps, and the BMS just won't let you do it, and you just wasted your money. So, from that regard, we set out from day one to design and, and engineer and manufacture our own BMS. I'll get into the reasons why in, in the next slide. But we wanted to design a BMS that allowed you to pull 250 amps. The reason for that is that through Byron Inverter, then allows you to run pretty much any household appliance you've got in your home. You can take it away with your caravan, so you've got a better quality of life. So you can run your microwaves, you can run your kettles, you can run your toasters. <coughs> so designing a BMS that allows you to pull 250 amps is a very important design criteria that we think um, will set, set us out, set us differentiates in the market because we haven't seen any that allow you to do that at the moment. There are some technical challenges that we've faced um, with designing a BMS that allows you to pull 250 amps with respect to heat generation and dissipation, um, but we've come up with a technical solution for that and, then, and it seems to work okay. So we're controlling the heat generation and being able to pull the 250 amps. The cons of, uh, or well, the disadvantages of lithium is, is cost. Usually the first objection that I get is, oh, they cost too much. Okay, well, yeah, there's not much you can do about that right now. But over time, um, and I guess we heard from Adrian today, and I was quite elated when you said that um, you know, what, what you're planning on doing, deconstraining or debottlenecking the, the manufacturing of lithium, um, will have a, a roll-on effect um, in terms of price of uh, lithium cells over the next five or ten years. Disadvantage really is the BMS. I mean, a lead acid battery, you don't need a BMS, but with lithium you do, and that's, and that's just a function of the chemistry and how lithium works, but it does add cost and it adds complexity to the manufacture of that battery. Um, it's essentially a printed circuit board, so someone's got to design it, someone's got to engineer it, someone's got to test it, and there's a lot of time and development cost associated with doing that, as we've found out ourselves. And there's generally a lack of information, misinformation, myths around lithium, and the media doesn't help when you have um, hoverboards catching on fire and then the media doesn't really understand the cause and you know, it, it paints lithium as the bad boy. And, and so what we find, we have to educate a lot. And that's part of why we're here um, doing information evenings with caravan clubs and all-wheel drive clubs just to get the message out there about you know the, the truth behind lithium is that lithium ion phosphate is the safest chemistry and you talk it through and then you, you overcome their objections. So education is is the key I think to this. Um, and we've got a long road ahead in terms of that education. But 
that starts here today. Price of lithium um, at the moment, the cells are making up around 60-70% of our battery cost. Um, there's no Australian uh, lithium cell manufacturer, so obviously they're all imported. Therefore, you're constrained by external factors, like the Aussie dollar. Um, so that is, um, that is a big impact, and you can see there, the Aussie dollar has dropped a lot over the last couple of years, and that has not helped pricing of lithium batteries. Um, so there is obviously a supply and demand um, curve there if you're, if you're a um, economics fundamentalist you can say that you know, as supply increases um, the price will drop. I um, hope that's the case but no one really knows how much and how quickly the price of lithium batteries and cells will drop. Um, John Grimes who is the CEO of Australian Solar Council kind of said 50% over five years. I think that's a bit uh, optimistic, but no one really knows at the end of the day. Um, in regards to the BMS, um, you do get what you pay for, like anything. And if you ask me what the most important part of the battery is, it's not the actual cell, it's the BMS. Um, because if your BMS fails, then you're putting your cells at risk and you're causing yourself essentially a safety hazard there. So what we found was that the BMSs that we bought off the shelf from China when we first started the business, the reliability wasn't there, the quality wasn't there, they didn't have the functionality that we wanted in the BMS. So then we set aside and we set out to design and manufacture our own BMS because it, it allows us to build in quality, functionality and reliability. More and more cell manufacturers are coming online now. China, as we discussed the last couple of days, is becoming the powerhouse. Um, but there still is a perception that anything out of China is not as good quality as perhaps coming out of Japan or Korea. And, and that's, that's fair to say, but there are some lithium um, cell manufacturers in China that have been doing it for a long time, and they're very good at it. Um, Calb is a good example of that. Calb is a was a state-owned Chinese company. Calb stands for Chinese Air Lithium Battery, so it used to be a state-owned company, and it's a massive company. They've been doing this for a long time. So that's one supplier, um, there's lots of others, and almost every week I'm getting emails from Chinese lithium manufacturers saying, try ourselves, try ourselves. So that's the problem with China. You've got so many manufacturers, how do you know which ones are the good ones and who are not so good? It's a problem for us as important. We have to settle on one manufacturer. Um, so it's about testing what's out there. And it's about um, ensuring they've got the right QA, QC in place. Because that's a big part of our, uh, I guess, uh, ethics in, in, in our businesses. We want to use quality, um, quality products. We don't want to, um, I guess, increase the risk of something going wrong. In terms of education, Tesla are doing a great job educating the market on lithium, so we'll leave it up to them to continue to do that, spending millions of dollars educating, and, and I guess more, not so much educating, but increasing the awareness around lithium um, with electric vehicles, but now more and more with uh, home storage uh, as well, as we talked about. Um, it's not the role of small business to educate the market at that level, um, so thankfully Elon Musk is helping us out there at least raising awareness, and then we do information even in this, um, at, at sort of the more technical level, the RV level, um, to educate the market around the specifics of what we're trying to achieve. So let's talk a little bit about lithium and the lack of understanding or, or knowledge around there around lithium. Unfortunately, lithium does have a, a, a reputation, and that's unfortunate because, as we know, there are lots of different types of lithium chemistry. Um, some have a, a more propensity to lead, lead to thin or runaway. So, to sort of try and combat that, we're sort of developing a book that we can use as an education and marketing tool as well to help our customers uh, read and understand in their own time um, and set the record straight about lithium as well. We can overcome the two main objections around cost and, um, and knowledge, and we're on the right track, I think. 
talked about the BMS and I've talked about the QFR, quality, functionality and reliability. The quality is really important in the production process. When you get something out of China, how do you really know what quality process is they're putting behind it? They might tell you whatever you want to hear. That's my experience with the Chinese. They won't, they'll never say no, they'll always say yes. They say no. So you've really got to go to China yourself. You've got to inspect the factory. You've got to meet the management. Really, the only way you have of, of uh, guaranteeing um, or feeling safe about quality. But we again decided to do it ourselves here in, in Australia because we can control that quality a lot better ourselves locally. Functionality, I'm talking about um, being able to discharge at 250 amps. There's no BMS that we could find in China that allows you to do that, so we have to design our own. Um, and make it fail safe as well, so build in levels of redundancy. So there's, what we're trying to do is minimize the risk to as low as reasonably practical that anything could go wrong. And that comes into reliability. So a very, very low failure rate, which our BMS will deliver that. Some of you may be familiar with the diffusion of innovation curve, I guess lithium, or the application of lithium batteries to the RV market is a very new thing. Um, if 99% of caravans out there have lead acid batteries in them, then it's, it means 1% have lithium. And, and there are some now lithium batteries coming as standard in the luxury end of the RV market. So if you spend 100 grand on a caravan, it's probably going to come with a lithium battery. And, that, and, that, and that's those early adopters, the people who have the money to spend 100, 150 grand on a, an RV, they're the early adopters, they're the people that are our, our, are our customers at the moment. Until the cost of lithium comes down enough such that we move into the early and late majority phase where the bulk of the population get on board. So we're really reliant on those um, early adopters that have the money and they just want the latest technology. And they want to benefit from the advantages that lithium brings them as well, so the weight being the most important. And what these guys do is they do the marketing for it because they go to a caravan site and they show all their mates their new lithium batteries. So that's helping to spread the word, I guess, and that's how new markets are created. It's as reliant on the early adopters. So really we're around about here at the moment, so there's a lot of potential um, there for, for lithium batteries in RVs over the next five or ten years. I want to talk about a case study now. This was in December last year. Um, we supplied a system to Fraser RV up in Toowoomba in Queensland. They were a customer of mine who bought solar panels from me. And then we did a job for one of their customers. Um, got a large fifth wheeler caravan. The customer wanted the benefits of, free, of um, lithium, so he wanted the, the light weight and he wanted freedom to be able to go wherever he wanted to go. So we designed a system for him, which included he wanted 200 amp hours of lithium capacity, so we gave him two 100 amp hour batteries in parallel. Uh, we gave him 420 watts of flexible solar panels, uh, 30 amp AC charger, uh, 50 amp MPPT solar regulator, and a 2 kilowatt converter. We saved this guy probably about 100 kilos of weight not just in the batteries, but by using flexible um, solar panels. Um, flexible solar panels, there's pluses and minus for them. The big plus, of course, is, um, is the weight. So that's a 100 watt, 140 watt flexi solar panel weighs two kilos. Now, if that was a glass panel, it would weigh around 15 kilos. So you're saving yourself 13 kilos for every solar panel. So it really does start to add up when you're talking about weight savings through batteries and solar panels. Um, and then you save 100 kilos, that means you can either take 100 kilos of something else, um, or it means you can benefit from the extra better fuel efficiency and economy of having less uh, weight that you pull in your tow. Just, just go back to the battery itself. Um, it's probably picture there to talk about the actual battery. We've opted for an aluminium enclosure. The footprint is around the same as a 100 amp hour lead acid battery, so it's a little bit 
It's about the same width as a lead acid, but shorter. Um, so it actually takes up less volume and space than uh, an equivalent size lead acid battery. Um, we went with an aluminium or metal enclosure for two reasons. One, for mechanical strength. So if the RV was involved in an accident, then it's going to offer a better protection of the lithium cells and uh, perhaps a polypropylene, polypropylene casing would. Um, but it also has as a heat sink. Um, if we're trying to design a VMS that allows you to pull 250 amps, that heat's got to go somewhere. And so we've designed the VMS to dissipate that heat through the aluminium enclosure and we've done the temperature readings to ensure that that can be uh, adequately dissipated. And as you know, aluminium is a great conductor of heat. In terms of the um, Components on top is a bit of an old photo now, but now we just have one common negative uh, that we have a positive for the charge and a positive for the, for the load. And Greg talked yesterday about why we did that. Um, so you can see also we've got um, a socket there to connect the, the screen, the display, which we give a 5 or 10 meter length of cable so the RV owner can put the state of charge display anywhere inside his caravan. And another port link up and talk to the microprocessor on the VMS so we can either debug if we have to or upload new firmware to the, the microprocessor so we can actually talk to the computer inside. So the flexi solar panels, these particular ones had high efficiency sun power cells in them. Uh, these are a new type of latest technology available. Sun power patented what they call back contact solar cells, so you'll notice that um, there's no grid lines on these solar cells because all you have circuitry is on the back of the cell. And what that does is it means you've got more surface area on the front of the cell to convert sunlight to electricity. So by their very nature, they are more efficient, up around 22% efficient compared to um, 18, 90% for a typical solar cell. So these solar panels um, have that advantage one drawback with flex solar panels is the heat. Solar panels like light, not heat. So the hotter a solar panel is, the less efficient it is. And that's contrary to what a lot of people believe. They think the hotter the day, the more output they're going to get from the solar panel. It's actually the opposite. What you need is light, not heat. So because these flexi panels are actually glued to the top of the caravan, there's no airflow behind the back of the solar panel. So they two depth they tend to operate at a higher temperature, and therefore the efficiency is, um, is reduced. And that's why we opted for the high efficiency sun power cells, is to try and offset the, the lack of efficiency through the heat generation. So there's just some other components there, two kilowatt inverter and uh, an AC charger. The reason we use that to kill one is because it already had a lithium ion mode. So when you have um, charger manufacturers such as Victron who are already making chargers with lithium modes, that would tend to suggest that um, you know, they can anticipate what we can anticipate, which is um, a higher or an increased uptake of lithium batteries for RV applications. <coughs> this is just a, a wiring diagram um, Greg put together. This case study, everything inside the red line is, was our scope of supply, although we did end up supplying them with the solar panels as well. We managed to convince him that there would be an extra weight saving by using the flexi panels. Um, so these are the two batteries in parallel, your solar MPPT charge controller, an AC charger taking AC input, and your two kilowatt inverter, and then your um, AC outputs or your DC loads can connect straight to the, to the battery itself. And that's a picture of the final installation. You can see the two batteries there in the corner in, in parallel. Um, the solar charge controller here, the AC charger, and then over the wall here is the is the, is the inverter. The end of the presentation. If there's any questions I can take. <coughs> yep. Yes. Can you um, find the discharging at 250 amps affected the, the light of the batteries? Great. 
Um, we don't expect so because the cells that we've used um, are, are able to be charged at that rate based on manufacturer specs. Yeah. Um, they're 200 amps continuous yeah. rated um, and for short periods that would be typical for the appliances that need more than 200 amps, uh, not a problem. And the BMS also measures the temperature on the cells which will indicate if it is becoming a problem and can throttle, give a warning and disconnect if required. Yep.